So the first part is to give you an update on what are the results from last year collected uh, at the very end of last year. Uh, when it comes to the monitoring and the level of implementation of the different pillars of the European Interoperability Framework. Uh, and then we will go in parts two and three to something more uh, practical. Uh, in part two, we will give you uh, some information on what are the next steps uh, related to the AIF toolbox that we consider it could be a tool, a useful tool for some uh, authorities, uh, some local governments, regional governments, and so on, to, to implement uh, basic things of the EIF, basic principles and pillars. And uh, in part three, um, we have the pleasure of uh, having on board three countries, uh, Hungary, Finland, and uh, Czech Republic, and they will be sharing with us good practices, how they are um, um, targeting specifically uh, some concrete uh, principles and pillars of the EIF, uh, how they are working on this, trying to implement these interoperability principles in practice uh, across different uh, levels of administration. And finally, we will conclude and we will give you also uh, some um, forward-looking uh, input for the future. What are the next plans? So. The team, I will introduce the team, is not only me, we have the part of the NIFO team, so basically Federico uh, Chiarelli, uh, Solène Vosot, Esther Blay and Constantina Chiaracopoulou uh, will be supporting uh, me in the throughout the, the webinar, presenting the different, the different topics. Okay, so if there is not any question at this stage, uh, we are still in the introduction. We will jump to the first uh, part, the EIF monitoring uh, results from 2020. We will give you uh, an update and also um, the scoreboards. We will be presenting you in a high level um, how things are progressing uh, at higher level, at scoreboard level. Uh, Esther, please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. You are uh, muted, Esther. All right, sorry for this. So I'm going to start by giving you some background information about the European Interoper Interoperability Framework, so the EIF, which was published in 2017. So the EIF is a commonly agreed approach to the delivery of European public services in an interoperable manner. It defines by basic interoperability guidelines in the form of common principles, models and recommendations. With regard to its framework, the, the legal framework, the EIF is principally promoted and maintained by the ESA Square program in close cooperation between the Member States and the Commission. With regard to the governance of its monitoring mechanism, it is covered by the Article uh, 1.2 of the ESA Square decision, which states that the Commission, through the ESA Square program, shall monitor the implementation of the EIF. Therefore, the objectives of the EIF are to inspire the European Public Administration in their efforts to design and deliver seamless European public services and also to provide guidance to this public administration in their efforts. And uh, the EIF monitoring uh, mechanisms, it ensures that uh, each member state is provided with its own level of uh, implementation of the EIF based on a recommendation by recommendation measure, measurement. Sorry. And to do this, uh, to achieve those objectives, uh, our approach is to use a series of KPIs through in the frame of the EIF monitoring mechanism to establish the level of EIF implementation for each country as part of an annual data collection exercise. And as you probably all know, um, the second data collection exercise was uh, launched at the end of last year, and we shared its results with you a bit earlier this year. 
and we will present you uh, in a bit more details these results in the next part of this presentation. Um, now diving into how the monitoring mechanism works. Um, the implementation of the EIF is measured um, by monitoring the implementation of the EIF recommendations. And we do so by focusing on primary indicators first. Uh, this year, um, these primary indicators were collected through an online survey of national contact points. And uh, in order to minimize the burden on uh, member states, we do not only rely on primary indicators, but also on secondary indicators, um, which uh, is based on uh, secondary, secondary research. And we also try to li liaise with other uh, commission uh, initiatives uh, in order to collect information based on um, already existing data um, from that are collected from other ongoing initiatives such as the Open Data Portal or DESI. And uh, the member states, they gain several uh, benefits from this monitoring mechanism. Uh, they notably gain intelligence on which operation the areas they can improve in, and they also obtain granular, granular information on their level of EIF implementation. And uh, other benefits from the monitoring mechanism are that it provides a simplified evaluation process through existing indicators. It also provides open data and indicators on interoperability across Europe, and it also allows uh, the identification of synergies across EC, facilitating operabi interoperability. And um, to visualize the results of the EIF monitoring mechanism, three scoreboards have been uh, created. One on the interoperability principles, one on the interoperability layers, and one on the conceptual, conceptual model. Um, in particular, each scoreboard uh, corresponds to specific EIF recommendation. Um, on the first scoreboard, uh, on interoper interoperability principles, uh, we see that uh, these interoper interoperability sorry, principles are fundamental behavioral aspects to drive interoperability actions. They describe the context in which European public services are des designed and implemented. And uh, this scoreboard is characterized by 12 recommendations, uh, um, such as openness or multilingualism that will be uh, exemplified by, by our speakers later today. And some of these principles have um, only one corresponding recommendations while other have more than one uh, corresponding recommendation. Then on the second scoreboard, on the four layers of interoperability are legal, or organizational, semantic and technical, which are complemented by cross-cutting governance components. Those, so these cross-cutting governance components are the first two uh, on the list. And then on the... Um, third scoreboard, which analyzes the conceptual model, which is modular and comprises loosely coupled service interconnected components. It guides the planning, development, operation and maintenance of public services by member states. And so now before giving the floor to my colleague, which will present uh, the 2020 results, I invite you to ask a question in the the function, the chat function, and sometimes will be dedicated to your questions later. Yes, Esther, uh, thank you uh, for these insights. I would like to complement what you said. Um, we are very much aware that the EIF in some of these areas is very conceptual, is very theoretical. So uh, in a way, we, we would like to express our gratitude to bear with us. <laughs> in a way, it was hard to define these KPIs, to do, to try to come up with a holistic approach on things, how things are do, progressing, uh, are going on in your countries. 
we are very much aware that sometimes the way we are measuring uh, some of these principles um, has to be done like this. It's impossible. It's touching so many services. But uh, what we have observed is that in some countries, the fact of having this kind of monitoring mechanism is uh, triggering inside um, the boundaries of the country a kind of raise awareness that we need to pay more attention to these principles, to these uh, levels of uh, interoperability and these basic components of the conceptual model. So it's a way to start uh, taking stock on what we are doing at national level and also coordinating some kind of uh, raise awareness and data collection with other major competent authorities in the country and the regions and so on. This is one, one uh, uh, take away. And the second one is uh, countries uh, outside the European Union, they have expressed from the very beginning a huge interest in being part of this monitoring mechanism. And you go to the dashboards and to the different reporting activities of NIFO and you can see that we have some uh, neighboring countries, countries in the neighboring uh, policy of the European Union and even beyond. Why is this? The concept of interoperability is quite, quite brand new. Uh, although in the European Union, we've been working for quite some years in other areas outside the European Union, it's not that well known. So for these countries, it's an opportunity also, first of all, to understand, to conceptualize how mm, these uh, elements should be taken into account from the very design phase and conceptualizing phase of an IT system and digital services to have a holistic approach. And secondly, it's also a mechanism for them to align further to uh, interoperability and digital policies. What we are monitoring here, since we are re relying on secondary indicators, these indicators are touching other uh, important uh, digital related policies in the European Union. So it's a way also for these countries to, to start to align uh, their efforts to these digital policies in the European Union. Any question in this regard uh, when it comes to these KPIs, scoreboards? Or... Maybe, Miguel, just uh, yeah. one addition because Eric was asking uh, about oh, the sorry. for better cross border services. and. Uh... Uh, um, I wrote in the chat that uh, um, we are working on a more interactive way to uh, foster collaboration, cross-border collaboration, and we'll present it uh, uh, later on during the presentation because we thought that the best way to address that kind of need was through the EIF toolbox because it gives the opportunity to interact. And the reason being is that... that uh, sorry, Miguel, you were uh, going no, to No, no, you wanted to say that my... If the question is also how this kind of alignment implementation of the EIF is bringing uh, benefits for for a potential cross-border interoperability, of course, of course, the fact that all of us we are aligned, we are following the same principles, the same components. Because at the end of the day, if you follow the conceptual model, it's relying on on basic uh, elements and components like uh, catalogs, open data, uh, interconnection of base registries, is going to help. It's not, let's say, uh, that straightforward, but it's the starting point. And we see these days in the single digital gateway regulation, the once only principle that we are still uh, defining the, the whole thing, but relying on common components and principles uh, is the starting point to 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 integrate the different com the different systems that they need to exchange data across borders it's not sure if Enric was eric was uh, along these lines the toolbox absolutely as you said federico um is the starting point also to give more practical guidance on how to implement services in an interoperable way with the the, the two dimensions, the cross-domain dimension and the cross-border dimension. And I see Eric, uh, Eric right yeah. hand, if you want to take the floor. Yes, for only a brief, it is about, it's not about the starting point. It's not the starting point. That's, that's the whole point. The starting point are the better cross-border services. That is what you really aim to. That is the, the effect. And what we are doing is analyzing what is needed to bring better uh, cross-border services. So it's not the starting point, it's the analysis of uh, the, the knowledge of an experience of a lot of countries that you should do these things in order to improve the cross-border services. It's not the starting point, it is the derivative. The starting point is the cross-border service. And 
And I think that um, we are focusing on too much on the IVE and not on the on the link from the IVE to the cross-border service itself. There should be more um, uh, linking to it so that you can see the improvement of the cross-border services eh, as, as it is valued by uh, European citizens. Yes. And this is not connected to the IVE scoreboard now. And that is, I think, this is what we see just half year year uh, in the Netherlands. We are changing now our scoreboard to have this link. It's very important to make this link. Yes, absolutely. And we are aware that we are missing this dimension because also all the nature of the EIF that is focusing very much on national interoperability frameworks. Um, it's something that needs to evolve. Um, also with the with the nature of the EIF, uh, putting more emphasis on, on the cross-border services. Uh, it's, it's a bit hidden. This dimension is a bit hidden in the in the EIF. I have to acknowledge it. What we have started to populate in the in the EIF in the monitoring is observing uh, for major EU policies like the single digital gateway, uh, open data, and so on. If at least there is alignment with these political priorities, uh, that's why I was referring as the starting point to understand if at least uh, these uh, cross, cross, cross overarching uh, policies are taken into account um, in order to um, to create cross-border services based on on, on similar uh, approaches, but it's indeed something to 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 pay attention further. Indeed, thank you, Enric, for your comment. Yeah. So, uh, so maybe for the sake of time, we can uh, move to the next uh, uh, section. Just so, Len, if I'm not mistaken, uh, please. Yes, yes, of course. <laughs> so here, um, we will present to you the European results of the 2020 IF monitoring mechanism. So we see the results of the, uh, the 2020 edition. So uh, that results from the data collection exercise you did last year and also early this year. Uh, so in this uh, three spider charts, we see the EU average for the three scoreboard of the EIF monitor mechanism. And um, we can say that the overall results are very positive. There has been a lot of improvement and progress since last year, especially in scoreboard two on the interoperability layers. Uh, almost all the interoperability layers reach the maximum score. And we found that a lot of effort has been put into the governance of interoperability activities across administrative levels and sectors. Um, so yes, very positive results, and we'll see the in more detail the um, and uh, I mean analyze the results in more detail in the next few slides. So when um, looking at the European results for. Uh, scoreboard one here on the map we see a lot of green which is very good the global situation is very positive again all the European countries are performing relatively well in the implementation of the, the principles and we found that several countries have improved in general in particular countries that went from upper middle performance to higher performance and these countries that are now in green, um, these are Germany, Poland, Lithuania, Austria, Portugal, Turkey, and some others. The list is very long, so that's very good news. And um, regarding the a bit more in details, there have been significant improvement, especially in the area of reusability, which is uh, principles four, principle four for Lithuania, Malta, and Poland. Then we have also noted some uh, significant improvements for principle six on user centricity in Italy and Germany. And finally, we have also identified a lot of progress for principle two on openness, in particular for Lithuania and Finland. So this is the general results for the, the first scoreboard. Then moving on to the, the second scoreboard, the level of implementation is also overall very high for the interoperability layers across the European countries. We have also identified some countries that, some countries that have improved in general since last year, uh, such as Finland, Germany, Belgium, Ukraine, Poland, and Greece. Uh, 
excuse me if I have mi missed any any uh, any countries, but I think this is the list. And in this area of interoperability layers, the main improvement concerned concern the um, the first layer, which is the interoperability governance, but also the technical layer. So as mentioned earlier, we have we have seen that a lot of effort has been has been put into governance, but also into the interconnection of systems and services. So on the technical side, side where uh, countries are increasingly trying to ensure technical interoperability uh, when establishing uh, new public services. So these are the like the main the key improvements uh, in the governance and technical layers. And then for the last one, um, for the, the third scoreboard on the, the conceptual model for integrated public services, we have observed um, that globally the results are also very positive. Um, we see a lot of green again. And since the, the EIF conceptual model promotes the reuse aspect as a driver of interoperability, we see that more and more uh, the European countries promote and foster this reusability act aspect so they foster the reuse of existing information and also existing sources and services for the development and design of new services so this is the main observation we we had we made uh, so uh, again so in this 2020 results uh, here some countries have have also significantly improved uh, such as germany romania ukraine turkey estonia lithuania hungary and some others again, and more specifically, we have seen a lot of improvement and progress in the area of open data. More and more countries are integrated open data into their business processes and in the development of, um, of new services and systems. Uh, more and more countries are trying to ensure that open data is machine readable and of good quality. And finally, we have also noticed that more countries are fostering and uh, the reuse and also the access to data, including uh, open data. Uh, so these are very high level uh, you know, analysis of uh, the results that we could collect this year for the 2020 ed edition. So uh, then uh, later in the, the next few slides, you will see that uh, this result has been published on an interactive dashboard uh, so that you can see more details of the results of uh, each country. So my colleague will take the floor and present to you this interactive dashboard. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Solen. Um, is there any question on the information presented this uh, high level view of uh, results per dashboard view or we can jump to the Okay, yeah, Giovanni, um, please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, this is uh, Giovanni Corona from Finland. Uh, thank you for for this uh, webinar and, and, and your presentations and that sort of thing. Well, I just have a quick reaction to the previous slides and a little bit uh, critical comment, um, but this is not coming to the consultation or, or, or to, to, to the or to the, to the commission. But to the member states, but I, you know, I think um, I'm a little bit doubtful that this is too positive picture. Um, uh, that that all the Europe looks like green, and that we have all we are doing high performance. I I just doubt that is this really the truly the case. Uh, if if we go deeply in 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 those implementation of those principles and and recommendations and that sort of thing. Would we really get a green picture all over the Europe? And if if this is the case, if this is truly the case, then we uh, then is the question that uh, that what is the scale of a measurement? Are we uh, how deeply we have measured the implementation of of of, of AVE and all these principles and recommendations? Well, this this is just a, a, a quick early reaction uh, to these slides, you know, I, because this is surprisingly green. These, all these maps you are showing to us. Thank you. Um, Miguel, if I can uh, react on that uh, as well. Uh... Yes, it's a very valid question, Giovanni, and it's the same question we are asking ourselves. It has to do with the methodology, with the macro view, but please, Federico, you are more hands-on and you can 
Uh, no, I was. I mean, uh, um, one of the reasons, uh, at least in my in my opinion, is that in any case, uh, the IIF, or at least the version published in 2017, uh, was first of all, I mean, published few few years ago, uh, back then, and is a uh, very theoretical. So uh, the monitoring mechanism is measuring the implementation of the IIF per se. So uh, given this uh, re uh, relation. Maybe, yeah, uh, as you were saying, uh, the, the picture is too green, but uh, uh, let's say the methodology deployed was uh, mirroring uh, the recommendation put forward. And I think this is uh, also aligned uh, with the review of the IF uh, that is uh, undergoing. And uh, uh, when the new version will be published, uh, there will be adaptation and probably uh, the picture will be less uh, less green and uh, uh, more let's say areas of improvements will be highlighted because of course the bar the stake will be uh, will be put a bit uh, a bit higher so i think it's uh, an interactive process uh, this was the, already the second version of the IF. there will be a third one so i think it's uh, a progressive uh, improvement uh, and uh, the bar has to be raised uh, all the all the time to ensure uh, the, the fostering of interoperability Is uh, Alena also would like to take the floor? Unless you, you uh, would like to react to this, or is okay for you? Okay, so we give the floor to Alena. Uh, thank you very much. A good morning to everyone. I just have small remark because we also discuss uh, result of Czech Republic that we become greener uh, continuously, and we reached the conclusion that uh, self-assessment is just one step towards the full results, because uh, um, our results are obviously improving after we improve our English, for example, <laughs> and after we improve our uh, the spectrum, the scope of our view when providing the information. So the more uh, we include uh, individual examples, which are not specific for a view of whole performance, but they are really good practices within our country, the better results we get in AFE as well. So self-assessment versus external evaluation, that's what we noticed. Because a recently published uh, report of uh, Superior Audit Office on uh, public spending in government ICT contradicts actually to positive news which we get from AFE. However, the AFE is very uh, motivating for uh, our experts, managers, politicians, that at least we include the principles, conceptual model, and all the measured qualities in our uh, strategic documents. So we take it like this, that strategic documents include, are aligned with uh, principles, and that they are individual examples of very good practice, which is evaluated. So this is our uh, experience we wanted to share. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's very, very interesting. This um, how, how you are in a way um, tackling this evaluation with external views. Uh, what we are doing here basically is a self evaluation. We are sharing with all of you a, a questionnaire and it's very high level, of course. My interpretation, and I will give the floor to Ana Rosa now, is that at least the, the image here, this map is uh, reflecting the fact that at least um, all these principles and ledgers uh, have been put in place, at least uh, in, in, say, uh, national policies, uh, national strategic plans. But of course, we have limited capacity and the assessment is very hard to enter into the detailed details, service per service to observe, OK, accessibility has been fully realized in this particular service. So basically, the assessment is looking more at how cross-cutting these principles and layers are uh, embedded in, uh, in national strategies, policies, and in the implementation of services without entering into, into the purely quality assessment, service per service, what is impossible. Um, Ana Rosa, please, um, the floor is yours. Thank you, Miguel. I only want to react on this uh, conversation about cross-border services. Uh, because uh, before anything related to cross-border services, we need to have these national strategies uh, already in place. I mean, we cannot produce 
good interoperability cross border if we don't have that interoperability uh, within our national uh, services. So I think that this is a good uh, step to you, you did uh, because we need to assess first that uh, these principles for interoperability have um, a good uh, ground on our national uh, policies. And then when we are ready and when we are uh, already um, exercising these uh, interoperability uh, principles in our national services, then we are ready to do the same thing uh, for the cross-border level. So I think this is the only uh, logical um, um, line to progress to, to the European interoperability. Thank you. Yes, Ana Rosa, indeed. Uh, that's uh, that's in a way what we perceive as well. I mean, what we are measuring here is just uh, at the national level, at least the, all these elements have been are being put in place. But it doesn't mean that per se you are already interoperable. But it's the starting point. It's like the first thing to to be done at EU level to to start implementing these basic considerations, and later on it will be much easier to work on a case by case basis, um, making all this. Miguel, Miguel, I guess, Miguel, you're uh, muted. Yeah. You, uh, yeah, you got muted. Uh, sorry, I, I was saying that th that was I was referring that this is the starting point. Uh, the, the starting point is for member states to concept to, to, to integrate uh, at the national level and it's very hard because it implies different administrative levels in federal states. It's very hard to achieve this interoperability overnight. But once you start putting in place all these uh, elements, interoperability principles, you start having a sound interoperability governance. What is the trickiest part of the interoperability layer? Semantic, but also the interoperability governance. And the conceptual model, more or less, you start working on these little components. Uh, you are cataloging services, you are opening up your base registries uh, and so on it will be much easier to start implementing cross-border services. But the first step, absolutely, is the national dimension, um, especially for uh, countries where there are different administrative levels and it's very complicated. Uh, okay, uh, any other comments or otherwise we jump uh, to the next part of the... This is this discussion is very interesting and honestly it's an ongoing reflection. That's why we are now launching the EIF evaluation. We are working on this new uh, interoperability policy, um, taking into account um, the state of the art, um, let's say the weaknesses on what we are doing, the state of the, the nature of the EIF that is very theoretical, but it's quite positive, positive that at least in this map we see that all these uh, concepts have been embedded uh, at the national level. They are part of the digitalization plans, digitalization policies, the, the interoperability is present. I would say this is the outcome. Interoperability is very much present in most of the countries in different areas of interoperability because well, the governments, uh, they realize that indeed it's, it's a very useful tool to, to, to bring efficiency and to, to provide better digital services. Otherwise, uh, things are done in silos, as we know, like in the past. OK, we jump to the next topic. Um, I think the floor is yours now, Federico, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And you will be presenting the the tool, the, the tooling thing that we are using to display these interactive dashboards. So please, Federico. Perfect. Thanks a lot, Miguel. Uh, just for the sake uh, for the sake of time, uh, I'll try to shorten in order to give a little bit more time later on to continue the discussion uh, in sharing the good practices. But please, if you have any questions, do not hesitate to raise your hands or interact uh, on the chat. Uh, so this year, we are happy to say that uh, uh, the results are uh, available online and uh, available on interactive uh, uh, platform. This means that you're able to display the results according uh, to your uh, needs. Um, the creation of this dashboard uh, has, has been based on uh, the needs that we collected uh, in the past two years. But if you have any additional comments, please feel, uh, feel free to reach out and uh, we'll try to address them as well. Uh, in general, what is important to notice is that uh, the results are uh, indeed online and uh, uh, this dashboard can be 
used in three, let's say, main ways. Uh, the first one is to have a general overview, a general overview of the results uh, throughout Europe. In this uh, page, uh, you basically will be able to see uh, the results of one or multiple countries, so you're able to uh, decide which uh, results to be displayed. And you can also decide uh, which uh, data, which year you would like to display. In this case, 2019 and 2020, but next year we will have also 2021. Uh, in this, uh, let's say, view, you will be able to display one, uh, let's say, uh, topic at a time. So you can uh, decide whether to display uh, the KPI level uh, or uh, the results of a specific recommendation or a specific uh, principle or layer of interoperability of element of the conceptual model. So here you can uh, uh, decide what to display and it's meant to have, let's say, one single uh, uh, um, uh, measured element at a time. On the second, uh, on the second, let's say, view that is available on the dashboard, you can uh, uh, play a bit more in uh, comparing the different uh, uh, the different uh, country here uh, the difference with the previous view is that uh, uh, you will uh, have different uh, graphs this is uh, meant to simplify the comparison especially with the line chart and with the bar uh, and the bar chart and finally uh, you will be also able to have a focus on uh, your country this third view allows you to uh, select of course one single country uh, to have the different data collection throughout time, so in this case 2019, 2020, and it will grow throughout time, but you will be also able to select multiple elements. So before in the previous two views, uh, uh, we said that you can only select one element. In this view, you can select multiple elements. So uh, the difference is that here you really have, have a spot on on your country and you're able to compare, for instance, if you want to check uh, how are you doing in uh, security and privacy compared to, um, I don't know, uh, semantic interoperability or uh, technical interoperability, maybe it's uh, uh, more uh, correct. So so this is uh, uh, done uh, to provide you with a better way to visualize the, the results. Uh, we will be dropping uh, the link in the chat, I saw some comments uh, are flying, and if you have any questions, please uh, do not hesitate to uh, raise your hands or uh, reach out to us. And uh, I think uh, uh, I don't see any hand raising, so if not, we can move on and uh, uh, go to the toolbox. Uh, so, uh, as I was saying before in the chat, uh, this year we um, implemented, we improved the toolbox to create a space where you can uh, uh, find reusable solutions or to better say, to find all the uh, tools that you need to uh, foster interoperability and more specifically the implementation of the IEF recommendations. Uh, the focus of the improvements are uh, 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 mainly four. The first one is the improvement of the scope of the solution. So while before we had only ISA square solutions and self-building blocks, now we are uh, expanding to national solutions so you can share your own uh, specific category for open SAD and S specification given the increasing focus and importance of those. Secondly, we, uh, following your uh, needs and your suggestion, we really try to focus on uh, sharing good practices, a, a concrete example, to uh, basically uh, uh, help uh, in finding out uh, what are the best practices around uh, Europe. We also created uh, a link uh, to the different elements of the IEF to the legal initiatives. In this way, uh, if you need, a, let's say, a legal reference or something more detailed, you will be able to find the link. And finally, we also uh, will be linking uh, to the different uh, elements or so recommendation or principles or layers, uh, specific open standard and specification to uh, support you in finding uh, what is uh, commonly shared throughout, uh, throughout Europe. And uh, uh, the third one, uh, the third venue of improvement is more focused on the community. So we want to create a space where you can uh, share your best practices, you can share uh, your comments, you can interact with each other and support each other. And this is meant uh, mainly uh, to foster cross-border uh, communication and uh, uh, then services, uh, as I was saying before, uh, Eric. 
And the third one is the development of an assist, an online assistant to help you navigating it through the toolbox since the scope is expanding a bit, so uh, just to facilitate your user experience. Um, this is, uh, these are the improvements foreseen will be, uh, uh, to, uh, will be implementing the, uh, the NIFO team will be implementing them in, uh, these months and the upcoming ones, uh, but to give you a better view on how to interact with the toolbox and how to, uh, find what we are looking for, uh, there is a short, uh, presentation, uh, given by, uh, Constantinos. So I don't know if uh, we can uh, start the video. Uh, yes, I'm just trying to put this to share the song with you. Sorry. Oops. All right. Here we are. Hello, EAS Toolbox users. The EAS Toolbox is designed as a guidance for national public administrations to equip them with the tools necessary to align their national interoperability framework with the European interoperability framework. In turn, in this way, we promote interoperability at national and European level. The structure of the toolbox provides a complete and holistic approach on interoperability and allows users to access information and reusable solutions or components that will help them tackle specific aspects of interoperability when designing a new digital solution. Information on the toolbox, including guidance documents covering the theoretical background and highlighting the implementation needs of the EIF toolbox, is accessible through different paths and from different entry points. The key entry points for any information seekers are the EIF pillars, which contain information on the 12 underlying principles, the four plus two levels of interoperability and the conceptual model. Another entry point are the recommendations. The recommendation page include a set of 47 recommendations as actionable items to be implemented by public administrations across the different EIF pillars. And finally, the solutions page. This page presents supporting solutions like those developed under the ISA Square and SELF programs that can be used as added components to help building interoper interoperable solutions in particular pillars or recommendations of the EIF. These pages are also accessible via the main homepage of the toolbox. The EIF toolbox is a dynamic solution that evolves over time. Hence, on the 5th of May, the NIFO team announced the release of the EIF toolbox version 1.2. This new release emphasizes on practical success implementation stories. So what's new in the EIF toolbox? Well, the repository of the toolbox is a live project, which is updated on a regular basis and relies on your contribution too. With a new custom page, which is available on the left vertical menu, we invite you to share your solution with us. If you already have a solution on JoinUp, then simply add your solution to the EAF toolbox via the online form. The form is located on the EU survey and requires only five minutes of your time. Prior to including your solution on the EIF toolbox, please consult the EIF brochure and then fill out this questionnaire on EU survey. The questionnaire will not take you more than five minutes to complete and will provide highly valuable information to us. All input should be in the English language. Now, if you don't have a solution on JoinUp, then follow the steps indicated by the JoinUp team. Another cluster of improvements that we performed is the addition of a new solution category in the main solution table. This category is the catalog of open standards and specifications. And for this one, we envision to include EU national and domain specific solutions around open standards and specifications. But also, we now provide further explanatory information 
for each solution, including the name of the solution, the solution owner, description, and the type of the solution. The final cluster of improvements is the EIF community. We created a space for interaction between the different EIF Toolbox users, where any community member can post a discussion item in relation to the implementation of the EIF. So if you have any questions, doubts, or comments regarding the EIF itself, off you go to share them on this page and we will be there to support you. All the community members are welcome to provide their comments under these discussion items. So what the future holds for the EIF toolbox? Two more clusters of improvements are coming up in the next release of the EIF toolbox. This includes the addition of resources to support the implementation of the EIF, such as relevant EU legal and policy initiatives, open standards and specifications, and concrete examples and good practices in implementing the EIF pillars as a source of inspiration for others. But also, the EIF toolbox will soon have its very own online assistant. The assistant will help you navigate through the EIF toolbox information via multiple filters and entries to access information faster in a more efficiently and user-friendly way. Well, we hope you enjoyed our quick tour. Stay tuned for more updates, and in case of questions, email us at eiftoolbox at anerb.be. Thank you. Okay, let's uh, hope it's clear uh, through this video what is the goal on the scope of the EIF toolbox. Uh, I see uh, Barna uh, raising his hand for quite a long time. I don't know if uh, you want to comment on the previous point on the dashboards, on the business intelligence tool or on the toolbox. Please, Barna, uh, take the floor. Thank you. Regarding the toolbox, I think it's uh, very, very useful. It's uh, much more user friendly than browsing a couple of hundred pages long PDF documents than uh, previously in the proposals and then whatever. And I think uh, navigation is very user friendly. I, I was browsing the page linked here in the chat and it's, it's quite easy to use. And um, previously, already before this meeting, we had uh, been using the um, the business intelligence uh, tool and uh, I have a question here. We spent quite a lot of time making comparisons. It was a bit slow, not that slow fortunately, but we, we uh, spent uh, uh, so much time that we were even late from another meeting and I have a question here. Are you planning to uh, make some kind of exporting available from the uh, web page, for example, PDF exporting or, or whatever else, because uh, if we would like to uh, copy a result from this uh, uh, Power BI uh, surface, the best way currently is to uh, make a screenshot. Or, or do you have any other idea how it would be uh, more user friendly to to make screenshots or or to export data from it. Um, thank you, Berna, for your for your question. Um, if I'm not mistaken, this is a feature. This is a feature we we were looking into through Power BI and is available. But I will give the floor to Edward or Federico to comment more specifically if this feature is already in place and how you can access this uh, export feature. The, the picture, I will take the, 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 the lead here. Um, good, um, good morning to everyone. My name is Eduardo Mosso, project manager for this uh, dashboard and of the EF toolbox. Uh, the feature is actually not currently um, implemented on the Power BI because of uh, license uh, problems. However, we are looking for it to find some uh, workaround solution, and this should be done uh, in the current, uh, well, before, let's say, um, before September 2021, hopefully. We are looking at it, and the, the full implementation of uh, the exportation uh, features 
should be then done by, uh, by October uh, 2021. And indeed, uh, Bana, your workaround to do screenshot for the moment is the most, uh, is the easiest one, is the plan B solution. Yeah, so okay. let's hope. Thank you. Let's hope in coming, in coming weeks, uh, because this is a, a very much wanted feature. Um, we were considering different uh, technological products. Um, this was the simplest one. Uh, to embed it in join up because NIFO collection is in join up. Um, but uh, yeah, we have this problem with the license. Let's hope we can sort it out soon. Thank you, Edward, for your support on this. So, Federico, uh, if there is not any other question from the audience, uh, yeah, because we are running a bit uh, late in the webinar, uh, we go to the to the feedback on the toolbox on the next uh, upcoming capabilities and features. Yes, uh, yeah, that's my turn. So let's uh, start with this uh, interactive session. So here we'll be using an interactive tool, which is called Bcast, with the little b uh, next to it. Uh, so I will share with you in the chat the link, um, because I don't think you can click on the slide directly. So you either scan the QR code that is on the screen with your phone, or you could also uh, go directly to this link um, on Google or from your phone, also from your computer. So if you go to Bcast, to this link that I just put on the chat, and then um, insert this session code, which is EIF Webinar 2021, then you should be able to uh, to be uh, to be able to be on the session. So. If you have any questions regarding the, the access to this um, interactive session, please let us know in the chat or raise your hand. But uh, if you simply uh, take a photo of the, the scan on the screen, then you should be directed, uh, directed to the, the BCAS session easily. So then I think in a few seconds, we will start with the, the first session. So which is about, so the first session will be, uh, the objective will be to discuss the, the content that you would like to see in the good practices and concrete examples of, uh, implement, of um, for the implementation of the EIF. So what kind of information you would like to see in these good practices in the EIF toolbox. So before starting, I see that there is a comment in the chat. Uh, okay, so, so Anna Rosa is leaving, so thank you very much for your participation. So I think we can start the first activity. We'll see at the same time how many participants are in. So the first question is about, yes, what kind of information you would like to read about in the concrete examples, good practices that you, the, the, the European countries, are going to share uh, in the EIF toolbox so that the others can learn from your experience. So the first type of information is about the specific details on how the practical example supports the implementation of the relevant interoperability principles, layers, or conceptual models elements. So if, if you would like to have like practical examples on, for example, one uh, interoperability principles, like for example, reusability, multilingualism, so like something very specific, then the second option is about uh, having information on the specific details on how the practical example good practices supports the implementation of the relevant EIF recommendations. So here, this would be information really related, sp specific to one or multiple EIF recommendations. Then the third option, would you like to have links to additional documentations or complementary information on the implementation of, of the practical examples? So for example, the link to the to the organization that are that is implementing these good practices. Then uh, maybe you would also like to have information on the solutions related to the concrete to the concrete example and good practices and how they are used, deployed, and also uh, they could be reused. Uh, and then you maybe like to learn also from the benefits of implementing the concrete example and good practices. So what are the the impact of these good practices on the on the country. 
And then the last option is if you would like to have information on the public organization implementing this concrete example and good practices in order then later to contact them for further information or clarifications. So I'll let you um, respond to this first question. And then there are also two other questions related. Uh, so the second question is about uh, to which elements of the EIF you would like to link the, the concrete examples and good practices. So if you, again, as I mentioned earlier, if you would like to have good practices at uh, interoperability principle or layer or conceptual model uh, level, so if you would like to have concrete example on the reusability aspect, catalogs or open data, or if you would like to have concrete example at EIF recommendation level, or the third option would be to have uh, good practices at pillar level. Um, which is uh, similar to, uh, let's say, scoreboard level. So the first scoreboard on interoperability principles, the second one on interoperability layers, and the third one on the conceptual model of the EIF. And then, of course, you have the possibility to um, specify another option if you think that the concrete example should be at another level. And um, the last question for this block is within the description of the concrete example good practice, would you like to have information on the solutions that have been leveraged for its implementation that are not yet part of the EIF toolbox, such as solutions at national or and local levels? So I think I will give you some time to reply to, to these questions, then we can uh, debate and uh, engage the, the discussion uh, in a few in a few uh, seconds. And of course, if you have uh, any questions or if any of the options or questions are unclear, please, unclear, please uh, let us know. So this is really related to the to the content, like uh, the, the information you would like to 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 see and read uh, through these concrete examples and good practices in the EF toolbox so that this information will help you in the future. Uh, to implement uh, and foster integrity in your country as well. Um, so I see that there there is no question in the chat. So I think everyone uh, has replied. I think I'll stop the activity. Sorry for that. Okay. Perfect. So let's see the results, which is very interesting. So, yeah, we have uh, four answers for the first options. OK. Um, I think there is a bit less interest for uh, links to additional documentation and also for the benefits of implementing the concrete example in the country. Also, just one of you is interested to have information on the public organization. Mm, of course, in the meantime, please feel free to take the floor if you would like to elaborate further on your responses. Uh, and then for the second question, at which level uh, you would like to have this concrete example and good practices? So let's say that, uh, yeah. At e okay, so at interoperability principle layer and conceptual model level, and also at EIF uh, recommendation level, which is very specific and I, I think very helpful in the end to to have uh, this um, level of details. Sorry, Miguel, you wanted to to say perhaps something. No, no, I just yeah. wanted to say that the 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 rationale behind this proposal yeah. we have observed with uh, bilateral yeah. talks with, uh, with all of you. Uh, member state representatives that the recommendation level sometimes is very abstract and there is a, there is redundancy and overlapping between different recommendations whereas the upper level that is more a principal level um, or the, the interoperability layer or the main uh, components of the conceptual model is more intuitive and you can cluster different recommendations you can get a better feeling on what's behind this uh, levels uh, not at the recommendation level but at pillar level so actually in the we are concluding the eif evaluation um i came across the final report the draft final report this morning and this is information we have collected from different stakeholders <laughs> there is overlapping we, we have seen that uh, what we knew already uh, there are a lot of uh, 
some quite of recommendations that could be clustered and they are not necessarily under the, under the same pillar and the same interoperability principle. So it's something to streamline in the future. So in a way, going to this upper level is going to also make the whole EIF toolbox more sustainable and scalable as the EIF will evolve or whatever interoperability instrument will come up in the future. Let's say going to this upper level is going to uh, make it more um, fast evolving and um, it, it will re it will be more stable rather than the recommendation level that may change in the future due to this um, lack of clarity in some cases. That was the rationale. Yeah, please. Uh, so then we can go to the next example, to the next questions. Uh, yeah, I think we will just uh, do this second section and then uh, I think we will move on with the, the next, uh, with the, the talks from the, the three invitees. Uh, so let's start this one, which is about the avenue to publish the concrete example and good practices. So here we would be interested to know from you what you would prefer. So where would you like to see these good uh, examples and uh, good practices and concrete examples in the EIF toolbox? So in which section of the EIF toolbox would you, li uh, you would like to find out about this concrete example and good practices? So the first option could be in the EIF community space, then as part of the solution sections, as part of the EIF pillar section, or also in a new dedicated section. So we would like to see with you whether you would like maybe perhaps to have a dedicated section on this, but then we thought internally we already brainstormed and thought about this, that this could be relevant to have these um, concrete examples and good practices published uh, within the EIF community space. This would allow the you, the, the, the users of the EIF toolbox to interact and directly ask questions in the community space. Um, so let's close the activity and see the results. So as we don't have so much time, so we see that uh, we have one answer in the EIF community space and one answer in a new dedicated section. So, and we only have two answers. So please don't be shy. If you have any other comments, please take the floor. But uh, okay, this is something that we will uh, consider and it's also along our align with our thinking, so it's very good. So I think we can stop there unless there is any comment. Ah, plus one for EF Community Space. Thank, thank you, Barna. Um, so now I think we can move on to the next section of the presentation. And I think uh, I will leave the floor to Miguel to introduce the, the three uh, speakers who kindly accepted to, to, make a, to give a short presentation today. Uh, yes, it's my pleasure to, to announce now this uh, um, best practice exchanges. Uh, it's something we want to do more in the future, giving you more time to do this. Unfortunately, today uh, we are really running out of time. Uh, so in the future, we promise uh, there will be more time devoted to this uh, best practice exchanges. So today we have these lightning talks. We have the pleasure of having Barna, Joanni and Alena. Starting by Barna. Barna is coming from the Ministry of Interior. The Ministry of Interior, um, for your information, and you can correct Barna if the information is, is not up to date, the Deputy Secretariat of the State of Informatics, that is part of the Ministry of Interior, uh, is responsible for all the activities and tasks related to policy and strategy making in public administration, IT infrastructure, electronic government services, public administration modernization and information society. So basically, uh, Barna is going to introduce um, the integrated public service provision for fostering interoperability very, very quickly. Um, Hungary is performing well overall in the three scoreboards, particularly in the third scoreboard with regards to security and privacy. And actually in your presentation, you will emphasize that this is one of the main uh, topics for digital services. You are, you are working a lot on, the, on this topic. You have, you have a comprehensive policy and a strategy on security and privacy. And so basically the, the, the floor is yours, uh, Barna. Thanks a lot for your time. 
thank you for the introduction, Miguel. Uh, yes, correct. As uh, we are going through my presentation, you will see how much duties I have, but fortunately I have colleagues to share them with, especially regarding uh, information society development and, uh, and public administration development uh, in general with other uh, ministries. Um, but the introduction was correct, thank you. Uh, this is my first slide and I, I think we can skip to the next one. Uh, I am going to share uh, how um, our uh, e-administration ecosystem looks like, what are the most important building blocks and, uh, and conditions for a better interoperability. Um, since 2015, we have had uh, a very strong legal background and uh, centralized organization structure even since 2010 uh, for e-administration. So organizational interoperability is uh, quite stable, not too many changes in the government. The structure is uh, more or less the same uh, regarding the institutions. Uh, legal interoperability is constantly uh, evolving, but the legal background is uh, also very uh, stable. As our law and administration is a general law, uh, and it uh, has uh, uh, mandating powers all across the sectors. Uh, regarding servant interoperability, uh, um, it is uh, very important that we have our base registries uh, in place. And uh, by now we have uh, managed to reach a stage uh, that most of the data is stored in uh, base registries and uh, all the other registries and all the systems are uh, obtaining data from them. So it uh, makes us sure that uh, data is uh, quite good quality and uh, everybody knows where and how to reach it. And uh, these base registries are uh, also very stable, so they don't change much uh, through the years. But uh, the specifications, how one can uh, access to the data or, or bring it away, uh, it is published, so the definition of the interfaces are available. Uh, regarding data exchange, we have a interoperability uh, layer, and uh, in the past three years it uh, has been uh, mandated or empowered uh, by legal acts and uh, information uh, technology developments, so it is uh, evolving. On the next slide, uh, I, mm, I am mentioning uh, mm, the whole ecosystem, and uh, um, here it is written security and privacy is very important. I think in privacy we have done a lot since 1990, in Hungary because our data protection rules have been very strict so far and regarding ICT developments we suffer quite a lot from it. Um, but regarding security in the past, I think two years our main problem was not uh, losing any information or, or information getting published anywhere, even um, private data of uh, people. Um, but regarding security, the most crucial point, whether we can protect our systems from uh, external attacks or, or, or any um, other uh, fraudulent activity um, that prevents them from working normally. So the most important security risk is uh, if someone can put the system down, any kind of system. It has happened two or three times in the past year uh, when we, we suffered such attacks and, and they were really significant and uh, uh, it is obvious we still have to do a lot uh, in order to protect our systems better. Uh, here in this slide uh, there is everything that is necessary for providing e-services and operating the state 
as it should be operating and uh, the coordination role of the Ministry of Interior and the uh, Prime Minister's Cabinet Office is very important. Uh, on the next slide, you see how... Um, is it the next slide already? Yes. Probably we skipped one. Oh. <laughs> because there was a process of the administration. But uh, never mind, uh, we have the recommendations here instead. So I mentioned already um, that uh, uh, we have still a lot to do and uh, uh, we picked some recommendations uh, towards interoperability. Uh, I would like to highlight uh, some of them. They are marked with little stars on the right. Uh, we should uh, provide these services in multiple channels. We still have a lot to do uh, regarding the mobile first uh, principle uh, that has been suggested in the past five EU uh, Council presidencies and uh, it has been written in important documents, declarations as well. Um, we also need to further standardize uh, our solutions. And it is uh, very important uh, regarding uh, the developments on the way towards cross-border uh, interoperability and uh, cross-border uh, administration, implementing the single digital gateway, uh, interconnecting our e-administration and uh, electronic authentication in the EIDAS uh, proxy network and uh, also standardization is important uh, regarding uh, secure delivery of documents or, or any data um, in between member states in a bilateral and also in a multilateral uh, manner. I think um, the toolbox is uh, one of the very important tools to check the maturity of uh, interoperability um, of our solutions. And there is a very strong need uh, for uh, having something to test with other member states' systems. And I think uh, it can also establish uh, the future implementation of any kind of uh, community uh, regulation. On the next slide. Bana, can... just uh, one reminder, yes. uh, we have two minutes left, uh, just uh, because we are already a bit... Uh... Okay, okay, thank you. Oh, so this was the slide uh, I was uh, looking for. This is the process of uh, uh, standard uh, electronic administrative uh, way of any administration in Hungary. I think it should be similar uh, to other member states and as we are short of time I won't start explaining this. Instead we should uh, skip to the next one. This is the municipality ASP. I won't uh, tell you uh, much about this as we have uh, blog posts and interviews published already on EU pages like the Joiner portal or the ISA Square uh, blog on it and just like the interoperative platform. So skip to the next one, please. <coughs> Here are the future goals. Uh, uh, I hope you received my uh, my message so through this uh, uh, B uh, form that you link this because uh, I was uh, telling you that the cross-border interoperability and the implementations of the single digital gateway regulation is the most important. Um, and also in uh, uh, in the field of interoperability, we think that automatization and uh, proactivity, so the highest level of interoperability uh, to be reached is the next step. And uh, on the next slide, in the key findings, 
I would like to highlight also automatization uh, because this is what we are working on now. Uh, all the ecosystem is in place, solutions are available, they are ready to use. Unfortunately, not fully in a cross-border manner, but we will work on it uh, together. But what we are doing now is uh, we are excluding the human factor from any administration. We have many ways to authenticate. We have uh, many ways to, oh, sorry, mm, <coughs> uh, to authenticate into the system and uh, also to tell the state what we want uh, from the state and the administrative body. Uh, there are uh, uprising uh, solutions, new solutions like uh, artificial intelligence and uh, face recognition and um, transforming uh, speech to text. And it will be an initiative towards uh, procedure and towards the authority. And uh, we are eagering to automatize as many uh, e-services as possible. It is our key takeaway for others. And if you have any questions, I am happy to answer. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Barna. Uh, for me, it's quite impressive. Um, the presentation is, is very, very interesting. It's quite impressive how you are building this repository of central solutions that is quite comprehensive, populated with very uh, useful components along the lines of the concept or model of the AIF in some cases and the integrated governance that you have behind. This is on one side. On the other side, it's also very impressive how you are identifying the typical electronic administrative process that indeed is being implemented in other countries, but in your case is very well identify a map to existing solutions you are working on, I presume. And then also um, this uh, service uh, supporting model for the municipalities uh, uh, on the cloud. Um, it is, it is, in a way, you are touching um, main main areas, fundamental aspects to achieve uh, interoperability uh, for digital services, touching different elements and different administrative levels. So um, we are looking forward to maybe uh, getting from you more insights on best practices, on examples, and on solutions that in the future could be part of the of the toolbox, you know, Barna. So the toolbox is open to you also to populate it with things that you could consider uh, important and useful for other member states to reuse as well. Having said that, if is there any other any question in the audience uh, about Barna's presentation? Okay, um, unfortunately, we don't have much time, so thanks a lot, Barna, and we need to jump to the next presentation. Um, because me personally, I would, uh, I have questions for you, but I, I will probably, we will, we can probably uh, have another session in the future and you can explain much better specific aspects of what you are doing in, in Hungary. So now we move to Finland and we have Joanni. Korhonen, sorry for the pronunciation, uh, if it's not right. Uh, jo Joanni is coming from the Ministry of Finance. The Ministry of Finance uh, is, um, is, uh, is tasked, let's say, has assigned policy making and the development and guidance of the state IT uh, operations. So electronic government is uh, an integrated part under the responsibility uh, of the government reform. It's an integrated part of the government reform under the responsibility of the Ministry of Finance. When it comes to the EIF, uh, Finland is also performing well overall. Um, what we have seen, and this is also linked to what uh, Joanne is going to present, um, there are two principles of the EIF where Finland is performing quite above the EU average and the first principle is subsidiarity and proportionality and the second principle is multilingualism. So uh, actually if I'm not mistaken Joanna, if I'm not mistaken Joanna, you will be uh, giving us more insights on how you are at 
uh, yes. in a way achieving uh, how you are working on these two principles that that not theoretical these are principles to bring uh, added value to to the citizens and businesses using digital services you will give good examples on how this is useful for for uh, for digital services so the floor is yours thanks a lot uh, Joanne. thank you miguel uh, thank you very much for your introduction and uh, first question how many minutes i do have Three. Uh, four, Federico. Uh, they agreed uh, 10 minutes and then it will be a okay. bit uh, of well, time. Uh, okay, I, I, I'll, I'll try to be uh, short. Uh, yes, we, are, we were asked to uh, present that how we have implemented a couple of principles, eight principles, namely principles number one and principles number nine. And uh, just to share some of the ex experience of Finland. So let's go to the next slide, please. Um, and well, this is just a uh, um, highlight of the explanation of, of this principle of subsidiarity and proportionality, difficult English word, by the way. And um, I, I'm sure that all of you know about these principles. And uh, the recommendation, recommendation is saying that um, at national level, you need to um, uh, align the national frameworks and strategies along with the uh, AIF. And also, if if necessary, to uh, tailor them, <coughs> tailor them in, uh, to address the national context and needs. So let's go to the next slide, please. Well, uh, this is the um, uh, well. Uh, how we understood your request, I'm not sure whether we understood correctly what you asked us to do. Uh, but about the subsidiarity and proportionality and. And as as you know that everything has to be do as close as the citizens as possible and, and at the national level. And um, we highlighted here um, um, one of the sorry uh, some of the um, main principles which we have implemented at the national level, and and particular which we have implemented in legislation. And um, and for example, this openness and transparency, which is in principles two and two and three, um, we do have. It's in in fact they have a uh, take ground in in the constitution from 1999 on even the constitution before that, and we have the act on openness of government activities from 99, and also it has uh, some some previous legislation where we have highlighted this this uh, openness, and and we have also recent legislation. And um, and um, and and uh, the recent legislation uh, uh, about two years ago, we we um, uh, we have set up a information management board, uh, which is which is um, um, uh, monitoring and promoting implementation of information management and data security things, but also promoting the openness um, openness uh, um, uh, of the government and uh, open data. Uh, open data within the government. Then I, uh, I'm not going to do all of this. Uh, we don't have time to that. So, uh, but let me jump to the. Is it the fifth? No, 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 not not previous. Uh, sorry, go, please go back. Uh, jump to the inclusion accessibility. We uh, just a couple of years ago we had um, a new law about provision of digital services, in, which in fact implements the accessibility directive of 2016 and uh, in that we have assigned uh, a state authority one government authority regional authority to supervise the implementation of this um, accessibility requirements in all all government sectors of 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 finland uh, and perhaps one conclusion is that that um, of this this slide and our experience that if you have some major principles, if you write them in a strategy, that's fine. But if you really want them to do, uh, want them, uh, them these principles to to go through the whole government and whole, all the, across the layers of the government, it's better to write them in the law. Just because because the government is following the law, so legislation is a very strong tool. To implement something, so uh, at least some of the key principles uh, highlighted or written in a way or another in the legislation. So perhaps that's one one um, 
conclusion on this slide. So let's go to the next one. Well, uh, this is just uh, we uh, about half a year ago, we published a new public cabinet strategy, and this is just saying that we have also uh, highlighted some of those principles in our new strategy. For example, in that left down corner there, that, that we will organize our services in, in a public centric and people centric <laughs> and diverse way. So, but uh, let's let's go further to the next slide, please. <clears throat> And then uh, you ask um, you ask that how we have implemented this principle multilingualism. That's also a little bit difficult in English. And um, and so uh, <clears throat> um, in, and the recommendation is saying that um, that you should you should provide opportunities. Basically saying that you should provide opportunities and uh, options for other languages as well in, in your IT systems and in, in your public services and uh, and based on what, what are the needs of um, expected users and the main users. So um, let's go to the next slide, please. So um, uh, just a reality that the Finnish is quite a small language. About six million is people are speaking uh, uh, Finnish language. So uh, so uh, our official other, other official language is Swedish as well, but this means that uh, because we do have a lot of foreigners here in Finland, and of course providing cross border services, we need to we need to cater and offer some other language options as well. And so most government central government authorities are doing that, and also major major cities. So let's go to the next slide, please. Well, this is one example: taxation for individuals. Or you can you can take the next slide, slide as well: uh, taxation for businesses as well. So uh, you you can uh, you can consult the taxation authority and, and and submit your declarations here in English. But not only or whatever you need to con con contact or consult with the tax taxation authorities, you can do it in English. But not just in English. Next slide, slide please. So, in fact, they are providing some other language options. I'm not sure whether they are whether they have full service there, but for example, as, as you can read there, so there are some Poles, Russian, even Chinese and Thai. <laughs> so, uh, well, the EU is not interested about those languages, perhaps, but you know, uh, because we have some uh, quite a lot of uh, Chinese immigrants here and Thai immigrants here, and and the English is not always that good. So, and motive in of tax authorities here is, is simply to collect taxes that all the who has uh, due to the pay taxes that they know know they they to do this. So, um, let's let's go a bit further. Well, some next slides. Uh, this is such a saying that okay, there's some other services which you can do in English, like moving, uh, changing your address, and the next slide, please. Uh, also, some some other um, government services, disabled land survey. You are able able to do it do it in English. All other uh, all all um, all ministries or all agencies are not providing the full service of uh, of different languages, but uh, we think that. Uh, uh, in addition to Finnish and Swedish, English is the most spoken language in any way that uh, that if people are using cross-border services, so they can use that. So I think this is the, what I want to say at this point. And uh, uh, there's, uh, in fact, there's one 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 more slide, please, and the conclusions. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, of course, um, this this uh, multilingualism is supposed to improve the services. Um, but we have found out that uh, not direct translation from the natural language to English or some other language is not always the best thing. You need to a little bit tailor it, or you a little bit explain that what it's all about. And uh, of course, it's the reminder that the more you offer language options and different websites and different languages, it's a little bit of workload for for those authorities to maintain maintains those different websites in, in different languages. And we have challenges in small municipalities. We have uh, municipalities less than 2,000 inhabitants, and they do not have that much resources to provide uh, services then in some other languages. So that's, that's a little bit challenge. But by and large, 
here's what I wanted to say at this, but I ho hopefully uh, I, I uh, will respond to your to your request. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Thanks a lot, Giovanni. This is a very interesting presentation. Um, uh, for me, uh, it's very enlightening. First of all, the difficulty of multilingualism, your conclusions, your reflections in a way are applicable to everybody. We we know that it's a, it's a very complex topic, but the way you are working on it is quite impressive. And also um, the, cap the, the use of law as an instrument, as a tool, to uh, enforce this kind of subsidiarity principle and proportionality, especially proportionality, to make sure that basic principles, uh, basic aspects are later on covered uh, in different pieces of legislation and they can be enforced as a tool, as an instrument to support the uh, implementation of digital services, bringing interoperability by default by embedding these principles using this law instrument. Um, we are running out of time, I'm afraid. Uh, we can only take one question. Is, is there a, somebody who would like to make a, a short question? Otherwise, uh, okay. We promise that in the future we will organize dedicated sessions and probably more uh, targeting a specific aspects of the EIF for the sake of uh, having more time and more uh, in-depth discussions. This is what we can do in the future, if this is fine for you. So, Joanny, thanks a lot for your time and your presentation. A pleasure. And now we jump to Elena. Uh, Elena, last but not least, absolutely. Uh, so, Elena uh, is going to uh, present um, the situation, the principle one on subsidiarity and proportionality and the importance of the central interoperability governance, that this is fundamental. And we see that this is one of the crucial aspects hard to be tackled uh, across the different member states, even at the European level, as some governance uh, on interoperability. Elena uh, is coming from the International Cooperation uh, and Digital Government Department of the Ministry of Interior. Ministry of Interior uh, is also um, working on digital government in the Czech Republic. And we have seen um, in the monitoring of the EIF that uh, also the Czech Republic is outperforming um, in the third scoreboard in the conceptual model, particularly in the security and privacy component. Um, on the first scoreboard, also subsidiarity and proportionality um, is scoring well in the Czech Republic. So, Alina, please, the uh, floor is yours. Thank you. So, thank you very much. And also, I would like to thank my predecessors who made uh, beautiful presentations. Uh, we were asked to uh, report on how we implement the uh, subsidiarity and proportion, the principle. And it was very interesting to initiate internal discussion because uh, our architect said, wow, they appreciate it. And we think that's a problem because uh, public administration in Czech Republic is uh, quite decentralized and the local and regional government for uh, historical reasons uh, resist central governments for a long time. So in my presentation, I would like uh, just briefly uh, go through more soft aspects of implementation of interoperability on how to balance uh, the subsidiarity and proportionality principle with the central governance, actually. So next slide, please. Uh, as Miguel said, Ministry of Interior is responsible for e-government implementation, but also for a public administration strategy. Uh, the fragmentation actually is a bit visible already from uh, our effort to unite these two lines, because for a long period of time, the public administration development and e-government development uh, were focused in different uh, government bodies. And relatively recently, uh, we have a joint effort. So this public-oriented, public administration strategy, client-oriented, excuse me, actually incorporates the digital transformation factor and reminds all digital experts about the purpose of digitalization. Why is it important? So not to dwell too much on technical issues, but remember that it's for citizens, businesses, and uh, public administration employees to simplify their life. 
Uh, we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, after some time, uh, the role of chief architect of e-government was introduced to uh, governance ecosystem of Czech Republic, and it had to be introduced by the law and also by government resolution who defined uh, tasks for this uh, body. Actually, it's a cross-sector interoperability coordinator. Uh, the body is responsible for developing standards of digitalization, manage shared services, uh, perform evaluation of uh, ICT projects and grant approvals. So uh, public administrations in regions re and uh, other sectors cannot uh, make investments before they get this approval. And I would like to take opportunity to thank uh, European Commission and ISA team for providing a uh, Czech translation of uh, IMAPS service, because uh, this IMAPS tool uh, is now incorporated in the uh, evaluation questionnaire, actually, and in evaluation process. So there is a very nice link between European interoperability and our national interoperability efforts. Recently, uh, the chief architect also launched a web page, uh, which is dedicated to main interoperability policies, tools and knowledge base. And our plan is to promote uh, European interoperability framework and toolbox on this page. And information providing and discussions on these platforms is considered as a basic uh, facilitation tool actually to get everyone on board regarding how to promote future interoperability. Next slide, please. So how is this related to the AIF? Uh, we have chosen to link it to recommendations like ensuring holistic governance of interoperability activities, ensure coordination, is done by dedicated public body and this dedicated public body actually uh, supervises the compliance with the shared infrastructure and promotes the reuse of available services which now sounds as a um, thing which we should take for granted but believe us it's not still uh, taken for granted every um, body uh, who presents the projects has to be reminded that shared services should be reused and not develop the new uh, functionalities. Uh, next slide, please. And this is the context for uh, future interoperability efforts. Uh, the Czech Republic has an uh, act on the right to digital services, according to which public administrations are obliged to provide all suitable services digitally by the end of 2025. It's also linked to the Single Digital Gateway Initiative, and this is probably the main uh, area where interoperability, lacks of interoperability are so visible. At the moment, Czech ID scheme is notified, uh, bank ID is implemented, the system of base registries is working. Uh, however, uh, until now, there are four base registries covered by uh, legal provisions. And the plan is, as Johanny said, to cover other uh, public databases and registers also with legally uh, obliged uh, rules and specifications for them to provide the same quality of data and same, same security. So this is the work done. We call it the uh, interconnected data pool and the new legislation is now in the process of approval. Uh, what is interesting for us is uh, learning from a COVID pandemic lessons, which actually uh, showed us in a positive and negative way where interoperability is lacking and where not. And to this, the key takeaway is related. Uh, we learned that interoperability is best achieved uh, in central, most important key projects focused on digital services. For example, during the COVID pandemic, a huge effort was done uh, to interconnect e-health related systems. And this was done with the help of uh, ICT specialists from uh, defense sector. So actually only this fact illustrates that uh, 
proportionality and subsidiarity is okay, but when you really need uh, systems to work and share data in a secure, interoperable way, uh, those uh, army experts were asked to help and do it in a very short time. So, uh, conclusion may be that, uh, as we can see, for example, in the case of using TESTA network of European Commission, interoperability is achieved for taxes and final services, e-health services, uh, like uh, patient information, cross-border exchange is now being piloted, social security services. So it's very important, according to our opinion, to link, to link EIF recommendations and models to specific projects, not to stay in theoretical level, but learn uh, from this very good positive experience that when something is a common policy, supported by uh, legal uh, regulations, then interoperability is implemented much faster and uh, more straightforward. Next slide, please. So the open issues, uh, although our chief architect department is already introduced and they have very good result, results uh, in helping uh, mm -hmm. create interoperability policies and implement them. You can see from the map that although Czech Republic is a very small country, those are uh, municipalities and regional administrations, which each of them have their own ICT strategy and ICT uh, um, projects. And it's really important to uh, get the common sense and common agreements on how to proceed forwards. And those interoperability services, cross-border European interoperability services, is one of the ways how to uh, motivate each of us, each of them, to work as a one country, not as a small regions. Uh, there is new uh, government e-government promotional campaign which stresses uh, digital services for everyone from everywhere. As you can see, a young lady was chosen as a representative of someone who doesn't want uh, to go to offices but wants to fill in her taxes from wherever she is and she's not interested about uh, complicated infrastructure which is uh, shown in behind this is only for those who provide services so the key takeaway is to remember that uh, we do it for uh, digital seamless services and all what is behind should seamlessly support the provision of these services so I hope uh, that I uh, met your expectations from this presentation. If you have any questions, we can answer them. Absolutely, Alina. Um, it's a very, very useful presentation. But very, very enriching uh, to to get to know what's going on in the in the Czech Republic. You, you're working in in very important aspects like uh, data exchanges through base registries, opening it up to more than this for uh, what is a complex project, but is, let's say, the tendency we see all over Europe and also triggered by the single digital gateway regulation. Also your reflection on linking the EIF to existing uh, infrastructures. This is a very valid comment. Uh, TESTA and so on. I would say also uh, existing uh, policies uh, on digitalization like the single digital gateway regulation. And what you are doing is very impressive. This goal is very ambitious, but uh, we wish you all the best for 2025 to have all digital, all public services totally digitalized. And also this collaboration with the different regions and local governments based on a sound governance and the usability of uh, solutions and components that this is the right approach. So uh, let's say your presentation has so many interesting angles. Uh, we can take one question in case somebody would like to ask a question to Alina. Um, otherwise, nobody, otherwise we, we close it down. Um, maybe we will contact you in the future, Alina, maybe to have a more uh, a presentation uh, on, on one of these specific aspects to, to, more, to dig in more and to find it out more about this, okay? So we conclude, we, we uh, uh, Federico, we can conclude because we are uh, 21 minutes uh, above schedule. 
um, we wrap up, um, please. Yeah, so I will be very brief because uh, we're a bit uh, out of time. Uh, in terms of uh, next steps, we just want to highlight that uh, uh, this year for the 2021 data collection will be starting a bit earlier than usual. Usually we will be starting in November. This year will be starting in October and the deadline for the data collection uh, will be an hard deadline because in the past uh, we've been uh, flexible on, on, on the deadline. But this year due to dependencies of other actions and other data collection, we really need to end the data collection at the beginning of uh, December. And uh, um, as just a kind of reminder, I mean, if you have any issues in uh, collecting the data or uh, you need any support, please, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. We are more than happy to uh, to collaborate with you and support you uh, to the extent that is uh, possible to us. And uh, the publication of the data will be uh, a little bit before than, than usual. This year has been uh, in uh, towards the end of uh, May this year in 2021 we will try to publish it uh, by March in this way you will be uh, all the you will have all the data uh, available uh, this is just uh, let's say a, a key a key message that we want to pass along because we'll be really strict in the deadline apologies for that uh, but in any case uh, uh, in case of any updates or any upcoming events Miguel was mentioning possible future uh, events in which we'll be focusing on specific aspects or uh, events in, dedicated to sharing good practices, then we'll uh, be reaching out to you and advertise uh, these kind of events within uh, within the NIFO, the NIFO collection. Um, so I just want to really thank you for uh, sticking with us uh, uh, despite the overtime and also our speakers for the uh, great presentation and uh, uh, insights that they shared uh, with us. Uh, one last point, if you want to uh, contact us, uh, uh, feel free to reach out uh, uh, by email. Uh, you will see the uh, email address is displayed on the screen and uh, you can also check a NIFO, uh, the NIFO collection uh, for any updates or uh, uh, insights that we'll be uh, publishing in the upcoming weeks. Uh, so on my side, that's it. Uh, Miguel, I don't know if you want to um, address any additional points. Uh, no, thank you, Federico. Thanks a lot to the speakers, also to the team. Um, I forgot to say uh, thank you to Constantina for the nice video and voiceover about the AIF toolbox. And um, we will be in touch with you soon. Uh, as for an autumn, maybe we will have another uh, shared practice uh, uh, session. Um, with more time than today, uh, one of the lessons learned for us today to plan much better. We have more time to to present uh, the topics and best practices uh, you are working on in the different countries and to have uh, more time for discussion and exchange of ideas. Uh, and I wish you all, uh, all the best uh, for the summertime, uh, nice holidays. Um, and thank you very much for, for your time and all your support in NIFO, in the reporting activities and the monitoring of the EIF and so on. That I, We know that is on top of your uh, regular duties uh, in, the, in your different uh, departments. So thanks a lot and we keep in touch. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a nice day. Okay, Thank you. bye. We keep in touch. You are muted, Federico, but okay. When you said the thank you, bye bye, you are muted. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I will stop the recording uh, and, and uh, uh, stop recording. Yeah, it should be.